Please all stand with me for the reading of God's word. If you have your Bibles, please open up with me to the third chapter of Paul's letter to the churches in Asia Minor, to the church in Ephesus. I'll be reading from chapter 3, verses 14 to 21, so please give your undivided attention to the reading of God's holy word. Ephesians 3, 14 to 21. This is the second prayer of the Apostle Paul in the first three chapters of the letter. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is the reading of the word of God. Please take your seats. Well, we're continuing along in our series in the book of Ephesians, and as I've already mentioned, we're coming to the end of chapter 3, which is recorded for us, the second prayer of the Apostle Paul. And if you remember from several weeks ago, the first prayer came at the conclusion of chapter 1. And Paul, in his summary fashion, really carries along certain themes throughout the letter that he has really hinted at in the praise of Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, and he carries those themes along today in the second prayer recorded for us in the end of the chapter 3. And it's interesting to see because, as one of my professors once said, he said you could determine, you could tell a lot about someone's theology simply by their prayer life and how they pray. You can tell a lot about how someone prays or what their theology and what their doctrine is by how that person prays. Not just the frequency, but also what they ask for and what the content of their prayers entails. And I think we could go even further than that and say this morning that what you pray for oftentimes is very illuminating because it'll tell you what your deepest desires are. Now, isn't it true that in, in life many times we pray a little bit harder or we pray a bit more when we come to certain milestones in our lives? You know, for high school students, it may be the final exams or what college that you want to go to. And in college, you'll pray for what job that God will give you and what major to embark upon. And later on in life, you'll pray for the certain spouse that you hopefully predestined to be with and to be joined in holy matrimony. And you also may pray for just how many kids and children that you have, or pray for your retirement, and that seems to be really the pattern of many people's prayer lives. And that's certainly okay, and that's certainly fine, but Paul shows us not only by content, but also by his prayer life, that prayer should be not just during those certain milestones, but also part of your daily life, part of your daily walk with the Lord. And so this morning, I have three points for Paul's prayer, but really it's just two essential headlines. One, I want us to look at the prayer of the Apostle Paul, and that my hope is everyone will be moved and encouraged to pray. Pray as part of your daily life, pray as conver con conversing and talking to the Lord on a daily basis and to fellowship with him. So I pray that as we look at this prayer, that you would be encouraged to pray. And that secondly, I want to encourage you, hopefully by the Spirit's work, that you can understand what to pray for. Isn't it funny that oftentimes in prayer meetings or if you're at a retreat and you just hear the people praying at this retreat, that 50% of the words of the prayer are usually just a repetitious, thank you, Father God, Father God, Father Lord, thank you, Father God, and you just repeat that over and over again. 50% of the vocabulary that flows out of people's prayers oftentimes do not have a proper biblical kingdom-oriented content. And so my prayer here this morning is that by this message, you would be encouraged to pray, but also that you would know how and what to pray for. And so I have three points, as I've said already. And first, we're going to look at Paul prays with a sincerity, his heart towards prayer, what moves him to pray, and why he prays to God the Father. So we'll look at the sincerity of Paul's prayer. And then secondly, that'll move us to the content of Paul's prayer, in which he prays essentially for two points. One, he's praying for strength, and then secondly, he's praying for knowledge. So what does he pray for? He doesn't pray necessarily that he could make his mortgage, even though that's fine. He doesn't necessarily pray for to un exactly for a spouse or who he should end up with in holy matrimony, although that is completely fine. 
He prays for one, strength in the Christian life, and then two, for a knowledge of the Christian life. So that's where we're headed here this morning. Paul's sincerity in prayer, Paul's prayer for strength, and Paul's prayer for knowledge. And so first, the sincerity of Paul's prayer. If you look with me again to verses 14 to 15, this is what the Apostle Paul writes. This is how he begins his prayer. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. So he tells us right here in verse 14, for this reason. See, what the Apostle Paul did in chapter 3 is this. He began his prayer actually in chapter 3, verse 1. He began his prayer there, but then he went on a segue, which is what we preached upon last week, and he shares a little bit about the mystery of the gospel that has come to him in the church. So he took a segue, he took a diversion, he took a sort of side note to give a testimony about the gospel, but he began his prayer in verse 1, and then he continues and picks up on that prayer in verse 14, and he says, for this reason... I bow my knees before the Father. Now, we shouldn't miss the importance of this opening verse and the importance of it, because Paul is telling us there's a reason as to why he prays. What is the reason? There's a reason why he bows down and he prostrates himself before the Father. There's a reason. For this reason, he says in verse 14. Well, what is that reason? The reason is the same one as he says in verse 1 of chapter 3. And essentially, the reason is what he has already explained in chapter 2. He's saying to us, and he told us, and he praised God for this, that he's praying for the reason of the uniting and redemptive work of Jesus Christ. That's what he explains to us in chapter 2. That's what he praises God for in chapter 1. I praise you, God, and I thank you, God, that Jesus has saved a people for himself in his person and work that we have been brought from spiritual deadness to spiritual life. And that through Jesus Christ and God's love, he has united both Jew and Gentile into one man. And so in light of these Christocentric realities, the Apostle Paul says in verse 14, for this reason, it is a gospel reason. The very work of Jesus is the reason as to why Paul prays and bows his knee before the Father. It's a simple reason. And I think we would do well to understand this and seek to apply this in our lives. It's nothing less than a very gospel reason. And the normal posture for a Jewish man to pray was usually standing up. But Paul shows in a sincere and unusual way that he's bowing down to pray, which shows that his sincerity is to one of an exceptional degree. His earnestness is one which shows his deep heart and love for the Gentiles. You can pray in any way, friends. You can pray standing up, sitting down. You can pray with your eyes open or closed. You can pray lying on your side. You can pray morning or day. You can pray any time that you want. You could even pray right now. But Paul makes a point, an emphatic way, to say that because of this reason, I bow my knees to the Father, and by him breaking some cultural norms, is showing his deep earnestness, his sincerity, He says he's a prisoner of Christ on behalf of the Gentiles, and now he's showing it. He's putting his money where his mouth is and saying, I'm here for you, and I'm telling you I'm on my knees because I desire to pray something for you. And he's showing his sincerity, and he's showing his earnestness. His bowing of the knee, brothers and sisters, was a deep sign of reverence to a universal king. That's the nature of what you do. When you come down, you bow to a king. And so when the Apostle Paul says that he bows his knees before the Father, he's showing us that by the word Father, he's showing a reverence to a king who is also his father, and showing respect to a father who is also ruling over him as king. And that word is important because he's bowing down, and he understands who he's bowing down to. And verse 2 tells us, or rather verse 15, is telling us, That God is father of all because he is from whom every family in heaven and earth is named. So why does he bow down to the father? Because he's saying every family is named after God the father. See, if you have a broken family and if you ever met anyone who has a strained relationship with our father and that's however difficult and sin-ridden and fallen that may be, the one point you can realize as a way of encouragement is to realize that whatever deficiency that your earthly fathers are, or you may be as well, can find perfection in the heavenly father to whom you could bow your knee to. And Paul is showing this, he's intimating to this, and he's saying that the reason that we can pray to father, to God as our father, is because every family is named from him. And when we look at name, 
it's not just simply to label or to give a designation. That's, what it, that's not what it means that every family is named after God the Father. It's really to say that God is telling us that he named everyone means that every family has been brought into existence after the image of God, that every family has been brought into existence and dependence, that we were created to be utterly dependent upon the Father who rules us. That's why he bows his knee before him. He thinks about the gospel, and then he knows who he's praying to, so he prays in sincerity because he's coming before a heavenly Father by whom all families owe their existence and dependence to. To be named by God means that our existence and significance depend on God. And that's why he bows his name or bows down his knee to God the Father. See, many of us, especially as parents, we try to teach our children to pray properly, don't we? And especially around the dinner table, you know, that's what I do with Riley. And so I, I have her pray. She goes through her list of what she prays for. And she usually tends to forget the ending of the prayer in which she says, in Jesus' name, we pray. Now, that's not what we've been taught, and that's the way that we pray, isn't it? And so Riley prays that as well, and she forgets sometimes. And I tell her, Riley, don't forget to close your prayer and say, in Jesus' name, we pray. And so what does she do? She says it really quick, in Jesus' name, we pray. And then we just say amen after that. But you have to kind of question the point, and one of the things I'm going to teach her later on is not to say that so facetiously, that when you pray in the name of Christ, you better mean it. Because you're praying in the name of Christ to God who is your Father. That you have an intimacy and you have a reverence and a sincerity in the way that you pray. See, many of us who have worked in the corporate world may have re remembered or realized that when you sign your name over to the company for your first day on the job, oftentimes in the employment offer, there is a vision statement or a mission statement of the company. And so you sign your name to this to work for the company, really just pledging your allegiance to the vision or the mission statement of the company. But in reality, many of the employees don't necessarily sincerely pledge their allegiance to the mission state of the company. And I think that that's sometimes that's how we approach God. It's not really with a sincerity or a genuineness in our allegiance and reverence to God who is our king, but also God who is our father. And Paul is showing us here by his example that he wants us to pray with sincerity and to really mean it. In Jesus' name, we have this privilege. That in Jesus' name, we come with the authority of the Son. We have access to the Father who is omnipotent, who has adopted us, and that should move our hearts to pray to him with reverence and sincerity. That's what Paul shows us. Ralph Waldo Emerson says this about prayer, and I quote, Prayer is the contemplation of the facts of life from the highest point of view, end quote. Prayer is a contemplation of the facts of life from the highest point of view. Well, what does he mean by this? And this is what it means. In your life, if you feel that things don't seem to make sense, go to the Lord in prayer because the lower we kneel, the higher we see. That's the way prayer works. The lower we kneel, the higher we see. It is the contemplation of the facts of life from the highest points of view. Why? Because when we pray, we're asking the Lord to help us see ourselves in reality from the perspective of God. The lower we kneel, the higher we will see. Or to say it another way, to gain more clarity and understanding in your life, you don't strive to be on top of the world but you descend to the feet of the creator of the world. When you descend low to the creator at his feet is when you'll gain clarity and understanding of your life. And that's essentially what the Apostle Paul is doing here in his prayer, and that leads us to the second point, the content of his prayer. He prays for strength. The lower he kneels, the higher he sees. The more clarity he desires, the further he descends to the feet of the creator of the world, God the Father. And so he prays for strength. He prays this in verse 16. He prays for power. And we saw this in the first prayer in the end of chapter 1. But we see this again in verse 16. That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. That's what he prays for. That's the first point. That's the first tenet of his prayer. And what this implies from the get-go is that the Christian life is one in which it is lived in recognition of our weakness. 
Why would Paul pray for strength if he was already strong? He recognizes his weakness, his dependency, and acknowledging his weakness is when he will be strengthened. That's what he prays for. Why would he ask for something that he doesn't have? So his prayer for strength implies that he needs strength, that he is weak. Why would Paul pray this unless in some significant way he didn't understand himself to be needy and to be weak? And the good news for Paul is that the strength is on scale with the riches of God's glory. And that's really telling us that from the infinite riches of God's glory is where we will receive the infinite strength for the Christian life. God gives lavishly and generously. And that's encouraging for us. Why? Because it tells us that no matter your need, no matter your problem, no matter your deficiency or predicament, God, your Father, is able to meet it. So I said this before, but I'm going to say it again. It is a little bit theologically controversial, but I think it's completely biblical. And I take this again from Melvin Tinker, but it was also given to me by another Greek scholar, by Bill Mouse, and they said the same essential point about prayer. And in Melvin Tinker's book, in his chapter entitled Providence and Prayer, he says this in the beginning of the chapter, that prayer changes things. And you could push that even further to understand that from the human perspective, from creaturely finite perspective, Your prayers have the power to move an omnipotent God to do things he otherwise would not have done. That should blow your minds away. Your prayers have the power to move an omnipotent God to do things he otherwise would not have done. And so that's where we see in, in verses in the Bible, James 4, 2. You do not have because you do not ask. Now, you have to really take these verses on parallel to realize that everything is still under the sovereignty of God and that everything happens in accordance with his will as he has predestined or foreordained all things to come to pass, but in a relational aspect, in a finite creaturely aspect, in the practical application of prayer, what the Bible tells us is that you pray because prayer changes things. We see that in the Old and the New Testament. And so Paul prays for strength because he knows that God will hear it and he'll answer the prayer. Prayer has a power to move an omnipotent God to do things he otherwise would not have done. That's the power of prayer. And so Paul understands this. He shows it. He lives it. And he prays for the first thing in verse 16 for strength. It's a prayer for inner strength. And normally when we think about strength or power, we think of brute physical force. We're focused upon the visible and the external. And even in a religious context, you think power means that something miraculous or charismatic or ecstatic should happen. We expect something that is extraordinary and visible. But Paul is clear here. He says, I pray for a strengthening and a power that comes by the Spirit to your inner being, which is another way to say your heart. That's Paul's understanding of power. That's what he prays for. What is the target of power? Not some sort of explosive, ecstatic experience. He prays for a strengthening by the Holy Spirit that comes to the inner being of your heart. So it's not always so discernible. It's not always so visible. And when Paul prays for strengthening of the inner man in verse 16, and he prays for Christ to dwell within your hearts in verse 17, he's praying the same thing. It's the, the, the syntax and the construction of those two phrases, strengthening of the inner man and Christ dwelling within your hearts, are symmetrical. It's really Paul explaining and amplifying what he means. I want you to be strengthened. May the Spirit dwell within your inner being strengthen you in your inner being, and he clarifies it and says, may Christ dwell within your hearts. So how does his strengthening come? What is he exactly praying for? He's praying for a strength by which Christ dwells within your heart. It's a strong verb in verse 17. It means that Christ takes up residence in your hearts. That's how you are strengthened. Christ finds his permanent residence. It's not as if he's vacationing in your heart. He makes it your home. He makes your heart his home. I got this insight from Sinclair Ferguson, and he says about this verse, many of us know that very admirable ministry called Habitat for Humanity. Maybe you've partaken in it, and I think it would be great maybe for our church one day or even the immediate future could partake of that. You make homes for people to live in, a Habitat for Humanity. And Sinclair Ferguson says here what Paul is telling us in his prayer for strength for Jesus Christ to dwell within our hearts, Paul is praying not for a habitat for humanity. He's praying for a habitat 
for deity. He's praying that God will make humanity a habitat for deity because he knows that's how you'll be strengthened, that Christ will take his habitat and his residence on your heart so that all that you do in your identity and your thoughts and your words would be moved by the captain of your heart in Jesus Christ. So when you think about, I need to be a stronger Christian and you want to pray for that, you can pray the way the Apostle Paul does. And just don't pray, God, make me a stronger Christian, because that's a little bit unclear sometimes. But you could pray specifically, make me a stronger Christian, Lord, by strengthening me within my inner being by the Spirit. And would you make my heart a habitat for deity, that Christ may dwell and find his place of residence in my life. And then thirdly, why does Paul pray for this strength that Christ may dwell within your hearts? It has an end goal, and that goal is knowledge. See, the strength that, Paul's pray, that Paul prays for is not necessarily to perform miraculous deeds or supernatural feats. He's praying that we could be strengthened so that we could comprehend the knowledge of Jesus. See, isn't that strange and funny? He doesn't pray for strength so that we could pray for 10 hours on end. He doesn't pray for strength so that we could suffer well in the mission field, even though he does pray for that. But in this particular prayer, he's saying, I pray that Christ may dwell within your heart so that you could be strengthened, so that you have the strength to comprehend the knowledge of Christ's matchless love. Isn't that interesting, a way to pray in that way? See, he's not praying that we would love Christ more. He's praying that we would have the strength to understand God's love more. We need strength to understand God's love. Verse 18, to comprehend. Verse 19, to know. That's why he's praying. He prays for a spiritual strengthening in the inner being. For what purpose? So that you may be, may be able to comprehend and to know the depths of Christ's love. You think that knowing Christ and God's love for you is so simple and basic, isn't it? You think it's so simple. Every, that's, that's really the tenet of the Christian life. I mean, if there's anything that Christians talk about, isn't it God's love? God is love is what we're often quoted to be. Christians need to be loving as God is. And so you think it's so simple and basic. Paul would never devote so many verses to pray for strength so that we may comprehend and know Christ's love. But he's telling us that's exactly what he prays for, even though to us it seems so simple. Isn't that what we've been taught throughout our Sunday school curriculum and lives and our Christian life? Isn't that how the old song goes? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. We are weak, but he is strong. That is how the song goes. And you think, oh, it's so easy. But it's not easy to comprehend Christ's love. That's why Paul prays that we have strength for this. See, God's love is deep and mysterious, and it's powerful. And he tells us that he will pray that we be strengthened to comprehend its breadth, length, and height, and depth. And some say that this is really just an allusion to the cross, you know, the breadth, length, height, and depth, and really just the four measures of the cross. But I think it's something more than that. I think really Paul is just trying to tell us the immensity and the grandeur of God's love for us in Christ. In verse 19, he says the same thing. It's, it's almost like repeating what he says. It's a love that surpasses knowledge. So he prays that we would understand the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of Christ's love. And he says it again in verse 19, that we may know a love that surpasses knowledge. Why is it a love that surpasses knowledge? Because a finite mind can never plumb the depths of an infinite God of infinite love. We'll never come exhaustively and comprehensively to the knowledge and the love of God. That's what he's really telling us that you can never grow in your understanding and appreciation and love of God. So that's why he says a supernatural hold of God's love requires a supernatural strength. That's the logic of Paul's prayer. It's not easy to know the love of Christ. It's not so easy as you think. If it was, you'd be much more of a loving person. It's not easy to understand Christ's love because if it was, you wouldn't sin as much. Your sense of identity and security will be much stronger in the foundation of your life. It's not as easy to understand Christ's love. So Paul prays for this, and he prays that the Spirit may strengthen the inner being and that Christ may dwell within your hearts so that you may be able to know and comprehend the love of Christ for you. That's what he prays for.
And you may be thinking, well, what is this knowledge of the love that Paul prays for? And what he's talking about here is not just some sort of intellectual love. You know, if Paul's just talking about, like, theology and doctrine, you don't need strength for that, really. Just go read theology books and systematic theology and books on God's love. Just fill your mind with knowledge and information, which is real knowledge of God. But it's more than that, according to what Paul is saying. If you just want a cognitive, intellectual love, I have a lot of books that I've never read in seminary, but you could get started on that. <laughs> it's real easy to do that. But when Paul uses the word knowledge and to know that we need strength to know Christ, he's not talking just simply about cognitive, intellectual knowledge. He's talking about a relationship, a relational knowledge. See, isn't there a difference between noting, knowing the facts and the attributes of a flower versus the springtime you pluck a flower from the grass and you're able to inspect it up close and you'll be able to hold it and feel the texture of its leaves and you'll be able to actually inhale and breathe in the scents that emanate from the flower itself and there's an experience in that? Isn't there a knowledge that comes with that? Isn't there a knowledge and a difference between just knowing the facts of artwork and understanding the worldviews and the intricacies of a particular time and how that really resulted in certain artworks such as a Reformation? But isn't it also very different? Would you imagine standing in the Sistine Chapel looking up with your very own eyes and breathing in all the air and the aromas of that ancient historical building with all the culture and history that came along with it, isn't there a difference in that? Sure there is, and that's why Paul prays, and the word knowledge encompasses both. You have real theological knowledge of God. It's essential, it's fundamental, but he's also talking about a relationship. It's the difference between knowing how a bicycle works and being able to learn how to ride a bicycle. There's a fuller knowledge that comes, and that's why it's so hard. That's why you need strength. How will you have this relationship where you grow in Christ? Not only informationally, but also relationally. Not only cognitively, but also in your experience, experience and experientially. And Paul prays for this, and that's what he wants for the church, and that's what he wants for the people who read his letter. And that is what Paul is talking about here, and that's why we need strength for this. And he's really telling us, really in the closing verses, that you can never be as spiritually mature as you think you are or you ought to be unless you are strengthened by God to know the matchless love of Christ. You'll never be as strong of a Christian as you ought to be unless you know God who strengthens you to understand and comprehend the love of Christ, not only in your mind, but also in your heart. Because then and only then will we be able to be all that we can be. So I know there's some military men here, and then there was a slogan that I think ended back in 2001 with the Army, but I think the slogan in order to get people to join the Army was, be all that you can be. See, the Apostle Paul is saying the same point at the end of this passage. He's saying, what does it mean to be filled with the fullness of God? That's what the goal is, be filled with the fullness of God. What does that mean? Very practically, God and Paul wants us to be all that we can be. And the way to be all that we can be is when we pray for God to strengthen us so that we can comprehend the very love of Christ. That is when you will be all that you can be. Do you not understand what Jesus has given up for you? The praise of the angels perfect fellowship of the Heavenly Father and Spirit. Do you not understand that Jesus was a sinless man who did nothing in this life to really transgress or break the holiness of God? Do you not understand who Jesus, out of his pure love and mercy, who went in the covenant, in the Trinitarian covenant, and said to God in eternity, I am willing. And he was obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Jesus, who loved you so much, gave his life for you upon the cross of Calvary. Jesus who loves you so much that he doesn't give up on you because he wants you to be holy and to be all that you can be. Jesus who loves you so much will return one day to bring us back home so that not, no longer will our hearts just simply be a habitat for deity, but in the presence and the glory of our Lord, we will have a habitat for humanity. And so I pray this for New Life Mission Church. And I ask and encourage everyone to pray like this with a kingdom-focused prayer. I pray that Christ would take the driver's seat in your hearts so that you may be able to comprehend the love of Christ and to be all that you can be for the sake of God's kingdom. Let us pray.
Father, would you strengthen us in our inner being by the power of your spirit. May Christ dwell within our hearts so that we could comprehend the depths of your love and so that we would know the surpassing love of Jesus Christ so that we could be filled with the fullness of God and be all that we can be. Lord, our sin causes us to curve in in ourselves, that we live wayward and sinful lives. But I pray that you would help us to see that that trajectory only leads to death, and that as we focus our lives upon the resurrection of Christ and what that means for us, we will see that trajectory leads to eternal life. So Lord, would you strengthen our hearts and our inner being? Lord, would you help us to know in our minds, but also in our experience, as we grow, grow individually and collectively in this covenant relationship with God, would you speak to our hearts, Lord, here this morning by your word and by your spirit? Would you soften our hearts, open our minds, unveil our blind eyes so that we can see who you are and who we are, that as we pray lower, we will have a perspective that is higher. So, Lord, I pray that you do this for us, each and every one of us. And we pray all these things in the power and the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord.